and the final final. It'll be coming, as I said, from my sainted namesake's cathedral in Orkney, where else? An occasion not to be missed, I trust you will agree. From Mastermind at the Old Laundry Theatre in Bones on the Goodbye. And that panel is on Monday evening on BBC One at 30. Coming up next tonight, inventions of the past and for the future in the GW Time Machine. Something is coming. It brings knowledge of other worlds and distant galaxies. It will answer the question asked for thousands of years. What is our planet the universe? How did it begin? When will it end? In a new series, Stephen Hawking and the world's greatest minds unlock the secrets of the cosmos, from the Big Bang, Black Hole, to time travel and extraterrestrial life. The answers have always been well beyond our reach, until now. Experience Stephen Hawking's universe, coming Sunday at 7.45 on BBC Two. Encounter a new series of tomorrow's world. Enlighten, Inspire. Innovate. Interact with the future through the science of today. Can this British car be the first to smash the sound barrier? Great. Here in Australia, have they discovered a vaccine for diabetes? The pulse of global invention. New stories. New faces. Join us for a new series of tomorrow's world next Wednesday at 7.30 on BBC One. Phil's going to catch more than the shuttle in half an hour. Happy holidays it ain't in EastEnders. First in BBC One, three decades of the inventions featured in Tomorrow's World, and the last in the series of the TW Time Machine. And welcome to the TW Time Machine, the show that's packed full of classic clips and memorable moments from the Tomorrow's World archives. And were we right or were we wrong? We'll be bringing you up to date on some of our early stories, proving yet again that the future doesn't always turn out quite as you expect. On tonight's show, Playground Prophecies. What a difference 30 years makes to the way our children see the future. Also, in Raymond's rock and roll years, Edward Curry is accused of being a bad egg, whilst on Tomorrow's World there's something lurking in Bob's woodshed. But what's the year? And meet a robot with a mind of its own. It's Hissing Sid, the star of Tomorrow's World's most infamous live demonstration. First, we've had a letter from a security company in Buckinghamshire, who thought we'd be keen to know what's happened to their vandal-proof door since we first featured it in the 1970s. I have to admit, this didn't sound too promising until we discovered that this is the door which has forgotten which side it's on. A cunningly disguised Peter McCann begins the story. Well, after all that, it looks like somebody else got here first. But my efforts show how difficult things have become for the would-be thief. Modern locks are so well designed that they practically resist every kind of tampering, except of course brute force. And that's hardly the fault of the lock itself, because it remains intact. When you hit the door, all the force is concentrated through the bolt and into the door post. This lock adopts a quite different approach. But when you turn the key, instead of it operating a small bolt, it controls a three-foot bar and any force that's applied to it will be distributed right along its whole length. I suppose this is one idea you can't call a breakthrough. 
Well, since then, the vandal-proof door has continued to keep Villain at bay. But as you'll see, it's turned out to be a double agent. Plain clothes police acting on a drugs tip-off arrive at a South London flat. They're looking for a way in. Watch what happens as eventually they decide to break down the door. I've never known the door we haven't got in. Normally we, uh, we get through all, but uh, this one's proving rather hard. Yes, it's the van proof door. Number two, Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be pleased to know that they did eventually get in through the window. <laughs> now, open plan offices, windows that you can't open, and automatic climate control. They're all part and parcel of the high-tech 90s workplace. But in fact, Tomorrow's World heralded just such an office 25 years ago, with a building that was also a roundabout. I went along to find out what became of that pioneering office block. Confronted by the rising cost of land, the Greater London Council decided to build its new office extensions on its own roundabout just across the river from Westminster. While it's only just a model today, in 1974, this will be London's first combined office block and traffic island. They called it the Island Block. It was one of the new generation of open plan offices windows and a scientifically controlled climate. Its many features included state-of-the-art lighting, heating and ventilation systems and the very latest in office furniture. Two years in the making at a cost of four million pounds, the office block was finally open for business. 25 years later and there behind me is the office building future. Take a closer look. Oh dear, it's all a bit of a mess, isn't it? The doors to this building were shut for the last time in 1990. And since then, it's just sat here, barred and padlocked, like some long-forgotten set from a science fiction movie. So, of all our high hopes, what on earth happened? The idea of the island block was to accommodate a lot of people in a pleasant working environment. The heart of the project lay with its state-of-the-art automated systems. Heat and light will be insulated too. First, by tinting the glass with a filtering pigment. Second, by installing automatic blinds which descend when the sun is out. Even if the sun came out for five seconds, the blinds came down for 45 minutes. Uh, and as they wore away and were less maintained, they would come down and go up and come down and go up. And then after a period of time, uh, they would be permanently stuck down so you couldn't see out. From inside this vast reservoir, the air is sucked into these aluminium pipes and is distributed to all parts of the building. It's cooled and filtered and re-enters the office as fresh air through grills like these on the windowsills. You were very prone to get all the wind blowing off the river onto the frontage, so it was actually quite cold in there. If we sort of gringed and winched about the cold and they drank the heating up to make us feel a bit happier, people in the north office used to boil. The result should be that each floor will receive a light, humidity and temperature control said that you couldn't have a kettle uh, in the office because it would have disturbed the air conditioning system. This scientific design climate won't replace the privacy and sense of territory needed by most management, so people will have their own offices as they do today. But those who do occupy these offices will find that their furniture is unusually flexible and spacious. It did mean sometimes that people became very territorial in the morning and find that your screen had been pushed back two or three feet and your desk might not have been in the same place as the night before. And so when those people left, you go back and push your screen two feet. So there was a constantly moving screen uh, around each section. So what was it that killed off the island block? Was it the dodgy air conditioning? The sunlight that prepared to come out in the rain? Well, no, actually, it had nothing to do with technical problems. 
Shopping would still be open today if it wasn't for the fact that in 1986 the Greater London Council was abolished. And when it went, the island block went too. I did actually return two weeks afterwards uh, and found you know, lots of papers all over the floor, cabinets tipped up. And it was a very sad sight actually. For all its fault, it's where you worked and it's where your colleagues were. It's very sad to see it. As for the Island Block's future, there are those who say the building should be pulled down, making way for a grand public square. The current owners, on the other hand, want to convert the building into luxury private apartments. Whatever happens, the future of the Island Block will be decided soon. But until then, this ghostly relic will simply have to stand as a monument to a more optimistic age, silently and patiently awaiting its fate. Now, the moment has arrived. It's another edition of Raymond's Rock and Roll Years. Need I say more? Tonight in my Rock and Roll Years, a great year. The pubs went open all hours. A neighbourly Australian warbled her way into our hearts, and on tomorrow, well, Maggie got dressed up while Howard dressed down. Year 1988. The longest serving Prime Minister this century. Eight years, 244 days have gone very quickly indeed. And there is so much more still to do. On Tomorrow's World, Judith Henn was exercising her power. This machine doesn't only have the unique ability to measure the huge forces generated in the scrum, but being hydraulic, it can also fight back. And I'm in control of it with this lever. So are you ready? Ready? No! no! it says it's perfect for beefing up the beef. <laughs> right on to Howard. Like. Just what you like, Judith. Eight men under your thumb. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Moscow, Reagan and Gorbachev teamed up. No one would have foreseen that the old hostility would have turned into what's now almost a partnership, even if a very wary one. It's hardly the most fashionable thing in rain wear, but I assure you it's very roomy. What's more, it's got something up its sleeve that none of the other spring collections will have this year. OK, gang, if you could just give me a hand. Certainly, madam. This won't take a second. Right, straight off the top. How's your hair, all right? <laughs> now, this is actually an emergency shelter tent for hikers. My Mac is becoming a tent. And things were just perfect when little Princess Beatrice was born. raining pink frogs in Gloucestershire or not. The Gloucestershire Trust for Nature Conservation believes they're African frogs dyed pink by the sand and carried over here by freak high winds. There was also some unusual wildlife when Howard tested a pool alarm. A crocodile? One of these floating in the water will detect any sudden splash and sound the alarm. You can even adjust its sensitivity to avoid false alarms. And in the pubs, it was cheers all round. For the first time, drinkers in England and Wales can stay in their local all day long. Look at me, I'm happy. Meanwhile, on Tomorrow's World, the debut of the beer can with the widget. But how did it measure up? Well, it looks pretty good, but uh, to show there's absolutely no cheating, I've got my performance head tester here. And, uh, it's over 19, it's actually over, over 20 millimetres. So uh, that's obviously the perfect way to get a good, thick head. But not everyone was as lucky as Kylie, especially Edwina Curry, who had to resign her post over this. We warn people now that most of the air production 
country, sadly, is now infected with salmonella. Those remarks confused consumers in juices, but Mrs. Curry remains defiant. Had she reflected on what she had said? Oh, yes. Do you regret anything you said? No. But Bob Symes may regret he ever opened this door. Wolfgang, what on earth are you doing in my shed? Well, I've come down to show my invention, Bob. It's a case which combines two different sorts of guitars, one instrument. Most of the time, it's an ordinary bass with frets. But by turning this key, I can lower the frets out of the way, and off you go. Still to come, planes, trains and automobiles coming a cropper in the curse of tomorrow's world. But first, over the years, tomorrow's world has inspired many people to try their hand at things they'd never otherwise have thought of. John Clayton is one such person. Here's the story of a man with a passion for the unusual. My name is John Clayton. I'm a computer engineer by trade, but also a bit of a dabbler when it comes to gadgets. If I see something that takes my fancy, and I can't buy it in the shops, then I'll have a go at making it. The saxophone light was out of an idea of using a redundant saxophone, which I no longer played, and uh, I just thought I'd make it into an interesting lamp. And what you see here is the machine made with the intention of winning the spot in the ball competition. The original idea for the globe came from the globe they used to have on the TV, conversation piece for visitors. This is the easy one. I've always been keen to watch Tomorrow's World, and in 1979 I hired one of the very early video recorders because I was arriving home from work too late to see it. Then the following year I was watching a program where Judy Pan was demonstrating a hanging tray on which she had, I believe, champagne glasses and she was able to swing this around uh, without spilling any of the liquid. When you've had a few drinks, handling a few drinks can end up in disaster. So, a designer has tried to help with this. It's his answer. A swinging tray for swinging parties. Now, I've investigated it and there's certainly no new scientific advance involved. Just putting centrifugal force into use. And the ultimate test, which I hope will work, must be to send this champagne full circle. Here goes. <laughs> I don't believe it. And nor will the waiters on British Rail. I liked that idea and looked to see whether it was available commercially. And when it wasn't, I thought I'd try and make one. So let's see whether we can't repeat that performance. The three-cup version of the tray was quite useful, but I soon realised that if I made a single-cup version, it would be more useful. I could actually take it to work and use it with coffee machines and some of our customers. The normal problem with getting cups from vending machines is they're extremely hot, so I thought I could make a single-cup version, which I could carry around with me in my tool case that would solve a perceived problem. I actually ended up using a tin lid and that was a size such that one could literally carry in one's pocket, take it out at the right moment and use it at work. In reducing the size of the tray, the strings have to be longer, but this still works very well. People at work were intrigued by John's new tray, especially his colleague Dan. John produced this gadget that he had, and uh, he proceeded to put his cup on the tray. Uh, I looked at it and thought, well, that's rather funny, but John then started to swing the tray, and lo and behold, the coffee didn't spill, it stayed flat in the cup. 
and that's the first my first introduction to the uh, John and his uh, famous cup and uh, I was tempted to ask him to uh, make me one actually but by the time we got downstairs I thought went out of my mind and uh, that was the end of that Well, now I'm sublime to the ridiculous. When did you last cross a river inside a large plastic bubble? Or use a flying car to escape a traffic jam? Exactly. Well, they're both in We had high hopes for at the time. But where are they now? though it may seem, that shortcut across the water is possible. This sports car without wheels is the prototype for a production model due to be marketed soon by a California car firm. The dream of being able to flick a switch on your car and fly off out of the cars on the roads need no longer be a dream. This is a prototype. It's the very latest minimal electric vehicle. Cars tend to be a powerful status symbol, but it's tended to become one of the most powerful fetishes in Western society. One of the dictionary definitions of a fetish is, I think, an inanimate object worshipped irrationally, particularly by savages. <laughs> Space shuttlecock! And that's a pretty apt description of one of the car in Western society. You're not going to believe what I've got in here. It is, of course, a luxury car. This mountain bike has been transformed into a two-seater by simply bolting on a conversion kit. This aircraft is a flying bicycle pedalled into the air by the muscle power of a single cyclist. The first known hydraulic bicycle. The success of the flapping wing may lead to a machine-powered aerial car. But it's useless. This is the very latest way they're getting to work or out of a restaurant in the United States. Designer Philip Ludvigsen comes from Denmark to demonstrate his new skate for us. Hello, Philip. Hello. And they're thinking of putting stabilizer on a pair for use for older people. Perhaps they'll even become the roller skaters equivalent of the mountain bike. Electric roller skates. It's actually, would you believe, the latest in human treadmills. And it's not for punishment either. It's designed to attract the sports car enthusiast and will be on sale in a month or two. Moving it around is a job for a secretary rather than a highly skilled and highly expensive helicopter pilot. That's all for this week. Good night. <laughs> now, it's become something of a tradition on Tomorrow's World that we don't just ask scientists about the future, we ask the people who have a real vested interest in it, children. We first tapped their brains in the 60s, and we went back to enjoy more of their ideas in the 70s. So I decided to see how the visions of children today compare. In 1966, we asked what children thought the world might be like in the year 2000. Some of their ideas were a bit wide of the mark. Well, in the year 2000, um, I think I'll probably be in spaceship to the moon dictating robots. All the Sputniks and everything. Uh, some, it sort of interferes with the weather. Because the sun, I think, will probably burn out. I think the sea will rise to about 300 to 600 feet. It might have an icy. Or if something's gone wrong with their nuclear bombs, I may be sort of cut from hunting in the cave. A few wild ideas there. But some of the children's predictions have turned out to be surprisingly accurate. Animals artificially breed so they'll yield a larger bigger and get food. There is going to be all this automation. People are going to be out of work and a great population. Something has to be done about it. And in the year 2000, there just won't, won't be enough jobs to go around. If I wasn't a biologist, I, that's what I'd like to do, um, to do something about the, the uh, population problem. Try and, try and sort of um, temper it somehow. But would the children of the 70s be concerned with the same weighty issues? Michael Rod went to find out. 
Children from the Lewis Priory Comprehensive School are enthusiastic fans of tomorrow's world. Tomorrow's world will be their world, and they have some original thoughts on what that future may be like. Well, my idea is that the skyscraper bends whenever the window cleaner comes towards it, so it's easier to clean the windows. Now an experiment in genetic engineering. Cross a hen with a cow to make a how, and you can have milk and eggs together. <laughs> This is a punishment machine for um, the classroom in the future. It's got um, an antennae up here to pick up any waves from uh, children who are going to do wrong. It's got a cane there, an automatic cane, and um, this grabber here picks people up, puts them over the stool there, and they get whacked. These two grab people and put them in, in detention. Well, 20 years on, and that punishment machine never did make it to the classroom. So let's see whether the predictions of 1997 are any more accurate. We've come along to year six of Breeden Hill Middle School and we've asked them what they feel the future holds for them. These are clothes that will shrink down to your sizes and you can just make one size and then they'd fit to all different sizes of people. We won't need pets because there's these new computerised pets um, which you can play with and you don't really need animals anymore. This new kind of computer which sends subliminal signals to your brain it's like you are not hungry you are not thirsty and eventually you die because you're not ha having anything to drink or so basically you die and um, because global warming shrunk the earth there wasn't enough room for all the humans on it so that all of them had to move and live on to Mars. Ooh. So not a very cheerful vision of the future then? <laughs> not really. <laughs> Whether the Earth shrinks or not, the children agree that choosing where to live in tomorrow's world could be a tricky business. Well, I think we're going to live underwater because maybe if the ice caps melt, the, the whole land will be flooded and we'll be forced to live underwater. I don't think it's much about the ice caps. It's probably about erosion. And um, when all the land has gone, we'll have the underground cities ready. This is um, a dome that could be used on the Moon and Mars. Do you fancy living on Mars, then? No, not really. Why? Because I don't really like flying that much. Maybe he'll feel differently when he gets a pair of these. I think in the future, you'll develop wings so you could fly and, like, your legs could go. Our body will evolve by having more lungs to take in different gases. The bones in our bodies will just, like, disintegrate. Different things like another kidney or one more leg and you'll be like a blob basically and you can like squish underneath doors maybe cut off your little finger because you don't use your little finger at all but whatever else has changed through the years it seems as though at least one thing will always stay the same football will be very popular it will never change because football is the greatest game on earth Fascinating. You know, I asked my four-year-old what her vision of the future was, and she said, a burger and fries, please. <laughs> now, a request for a favourite clip from the Tomorrow's World archives, and it's one of my favourites, too. I've been enjoying the TW time machine and have loved seeing key interesting blasts from the past. One of my favourites that I particularly remember was of Karen Prenderwill with Hissing Sid. Would you please show this again? It'd be such a treat. Thank you. The flamboyant Prenderville Kieran takes the cue ball out of the pocket and places it for his opponent, the world champion of the year 2000. Prenderville is waiting for the action of his opponent. Any moment now, it will happen. Well, we appear to Nothing appears to be happening. Let me introduce first of all. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, God. Opponent's back at it. He places the cue ball in the spot he wanted. It's on the yellow spot. Which ball is he going to pop? He's in for a big break. Takes the cue. A two way cue and the red into the bottom pocket. <laughs> but it's not quite there. You're going to get another chance now, Sid. So do it right. The mix is aiming him at. The makers are aiming him at industry, where they hope he'll do the kind of light lifting and packing work that many robots can actually do already, but are just too expensive to buy. And right now, I feel like breaking him with an axe. 
All right, Sid, we'll see you later. Yeah. yeah. You guys all day? No, not all.